thank you very much, and thank you for being patient. I thought if we delayed any more, I would have to talk very fast to get everything in. It's a great honor to be here, and I'd like to thank Professor Katayama and John Amatello for inviting me. Um, I always look at people your age as the, our future, and you are responsible for a lot of the security of this country. So it is especially a privilege to be talking with you. I'm talking today about leadership, ethics, and behavioral science. My expertise is in the behavioral science part. I start with what leadership is, then behavioral science, and lastly, how it all interacts in terms of ethical considerations. Good leaders, what are good leaders? Well, you think of Alexander the Great, who rode on his horse in front of his troops, because lead means to go in front of. You're also expected to provide exemplary behavior. But I'm sure all of you know of at least one instance where there has been a wonderful leader going in front, providing exemplary behavior, and that didn't mean that all of the presumed followers behave in an exemplary way. So, your job really is not just to be an illustrator of what is ideal, though of course that's wonderful and good, but really to help other cadets and to help them in particular do reliably and confidently all the technical skills you have, which are so critical for the safety and the operation of the Air Force. Also to follow the Air Force rules about mode of conduct, and there's where you can be your exemplar for your fellow cadets. And ideally you want them to all do this willingly without having your constant having to check up on them. Because when you're in an actual situation, you're not going to have somebody looking over you to grade you on, on your performance. It has to work on your own. So you manage behavior. That's my area. So what is, determines what somebody does? Well, there are only three things. First is genetics. That plays a large part. If you were born six foot seven tall, you probably would not be good in a helicopter unit if you have a small cabin or something. Um, but you would be great for, for basketball. Uh, but not everything we, we're born with, we're not born with much. We're born with reflexes. And you react to, to antecedent stimuli, like if, if all of a sudden the floor here dropped, we would all have a startled reflex. All of us. That's part of our genetics. But then there is also respondent conditioning, which was discovered by Pavlov. And we'll go into that a little bit. Respondent conditioning is really concerned with more with emotions as well as reflexes like an eye blink. And lastly, operant conditioning, and that was discovered by B.F. Skinner. And you'll have to excuse me for talking about my father as B.F. Skinner, but it becomes a little bit odd when you're teaching to go into a classroom and say, now on page 64 of Walden II, Daddy says, <laughs> so I learned to talk about my father as Skinner, and it doesn't mean any kind of lack of emotion. <clears throat> the one thing that's here is that if you're looking at scientific accounts of behavior and the causes of behavior, there is no such thing as free will. 
Okay, reflexes. <coughs> Some are inborn, as I mentioned, and others are acquired. <coughs> One of the ones that is, is uh, a problem in any kind of dangerous situation, like in the Air Force, is any kind of injury which will cause fear. It could, doesn't have to be injury to you. It could be injury to your buddy. It could be injury to someone else that you care about. But it typically will produce fear. That is a natural in, inherited, probably. Sometimes loud sounds or other kinds of stimuli precede that, and you get operant condition, I mean, respondent conditioning that Pavlov did, which is now the loud sounds produce fear. Um, a colleague of mine had a husband who served in Afghanistan. He had a very bad, tragic episode, not to him, but to his, the pal that was right next to him. And it was preceded by uh, sounds, loud sounds. And he now has to, he's out now, and he has to live in a country. He can't live in a city because of the anxiety that's produced by those loud sounds. A lot of PTSD is, is a result of the Pavlovian conditioning. What's important, though, is that the behavior, which in this case is fear, is not new. This is old behavior you already have. It may be exaggerated, but it's not a new kind of action. So you've got your fear, you've got the old reaction, it's paired with a new situation, and now the new situation produces the old reflex kind of reaction. Control for this kind of behavior comes before the behavior that we're talk talking about. And that's critical because now we go to antecedent control. Now we come to operant behavior, which is everything else, which includes talking, even walking is operant behavior. Pretty much everything that you do in training is operant behavior, except for some of the work with emotions. But even there, you can train operant responses which will overcome fear and other kinds of negative things. All right, so these are some of the things that I had mentioned are the goals. And all of those are operant. Operant is everything except for um, physiological reactions. And you're not born with, with operants. They are all acquired. <laughs> Operant conditioning is a process of selection by consequences. You've probably heard of, of reinforcement and consequences. The important thing to know is this is what comes after a behavior. Now, it doesn't strengthen that behavior, but it strengthens behaviors that are like that behavior. And it's called postcedent control. So you have antecedent control for respondents and postcedent for operants. Two kinds of consequences. Reinforcement <coughs> makes actions more likely. And punishment makes actions less likely in the future. Now we're going to go a little bit into punishment. Unfortunately, punishment doesn't remove the reinforcement maintaining a behavior, but it does su suppress behavior. The problem with it is it can't produce the behavior you want instead. You get rid of one thing, but it doesn't, it doesn't first of all, inform your cadet what he's supposed to be doing instead, although usually he probably will know. But it won't build it. And it has a lot of byproducts. You probably are familiar with some of them. Anxiety or fear is one. Avoidance, if you get caught by someone doing something, saying a bad word, something you're not supposed to do, and you're punished by that person, you don't necessarily avoid your swearing. You avoid doing it in front of that person. So you avoid getting caught, or you may escape. If you see someone coming and you're doing something, you might hide. It inevitably produce poor morale. Counter control. If you are punished, you have a tendency to want to hit back. And unfortunately, also violence. We've seen in the school shootings, if you look at the perpetrators, inevitably they have a history somewhere of a lot of punishment. These are not the actions you need. So 
Why do we do it? Well, first of all, it doesn't exactly require <coughs> any training. Anybody can punish. It's easy. But it's also operant behavior. The act of punishing is operant. So where do we look to find the causes? Well, all operant behavior is selection by consequences, so where would you look? You look at the consequences. So, you've got action going on that you want to stop, you punish, and what happens? It stops. That is reinforcement of punishing. So your behavior of punishing has been reinforced. And what that means is that like any other operant, the effect on you <coughs> is to increase punishment as your method of control over others. Not only that, but it tends to be, have escalation effects. You say, cadet, pick up that trash. And the cadet does it immediately your punishing has, or screaming at him has just been <laughs> reinforced, right? But if he doesn't pick it up, what's the tendency? Tendency is to escalate. Cadet! If you don't enforce a stronger punishment. It doesn't build better leadership, in other words. Okay, so we have the effects of punishment, and you have to look at what are the, diff the balancing, if you want to look at the ethical effects. What, is, what are the effects you're going to get from doing it in the short term and the long term? You think of, um, there are times when we accept punishment, very punitive things, like sticking a needle into a child's arm. Well, if you're doing inoculation, science tells you that the long-term effects of not doing this are terrible. And in fact, there's been a pickup of all kinds of diseases, particularly in, in Europe, because people are not inoculating their kids. And then there are short-term benefits. You punish, you, get, you stop the action, but well, what are the long-term effects? You have to look. There are times when you need to punish. You cannot let some very dangerous behavior go on and on and on. You have to stop it now. But as a general method of control, look at balancing those things. That's what ethics is all about, is balancing. Okay, so what's the alternative of punishment? Obviously, it's to build with positive reinforcement, and that there's a whole science behind this, and it's an extensive science, as some of you are studying it, and know that it's uh, fairly complex. And of course, always you try to do prevention rather than fixing a problem. I'm gonna give you an example of uh, some operant training that was done an example of training of surgeons. They had objectives very much like yours, except of course they wanted to follow hospital rules. And this was one of the tasks. You have to tie a one-handed surgical knot. Meanwhile, forget, don't, don't forget you're inside somebody's body as you're doing this and it's kind of slimy and you can't see what you're doing. <clears throat> this they call a simple skill. <laughs> All right, there are training that uh, Dr. Levy did was they gave directions. They used a bigger string so you could see it, um, demonstrated, had the intern try, and the typical training in the hospital is, no, you're not doing it right. No, didn't you see how I did it? Loudly and in front of others. It was very aversive. Well, of course, they had the usual problems. They did not produce liable, confident performance. And the one thing you want in an operating room is reliable, confident performance. You don't want somebody saying, I think this is the heart. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, do I include this when I tie it? <laughs> OK, so they also, students became anxious, unhappy, and they became hostile. Of course, they're not going to 
to directly confront their, their master surgeon, but they said nasty comments behind their back. And I'm sure every one of you has heard nasty comments about somebody who has been punitive either to you or to your peers. So he changed procedures. And he did, after uh, three years, he did a control group with one group getting one training and another. He used operant conditioning and he published it in an in a orthopedic journal. His question was, is teaching simple surgical skills using an operant learning paradigm more effective than teaching by demonstration? He didn't put in the title and screaming, but it was there. Because that's <coughs> frequent there. His answer, of course, was yes. So what are these procedures? Well, I'm going to go through them very quickly. I'm sure that most of them you have seen. A lot of your training that I've heard about so far follows these. <coughs> but first is to set behavioral goals. And I think there are places that were kind of wishy-washy on goals where they need to be set in terms of, well, how, what's the evidence that somebody is motivated? What do they do when they are motivated that they don't do if they're not? You break into steps. This was one of the main things they did. Instead of just doing, this is, this is how you do the thing, they broke it into different steps. They, um, and uh, less lecturing and more doing. And that's one of the main behavioral principles is that you can't shape behavior by somebody sitting and listening. Demonstration is helpful. I'm not saying it's not. But you, you need to get the, your cadet doing things, which in the Air Force you do a lot, so that's great. Give immediate feedback. And in fact, they actually, Dr. Levy was a dog trainer, and he used a clicker that you use for dogs for his surgeons as they did the right things. And people object to using a dog trainer. Use a counter. This, this gives a click, too, and it also counts the number of corrects. If you want to get a rate of behavior, which is another thing that's very important, because you have to not only do things well, but you have to do them fast, usually. Try again if needed. That was the big thing. No more, you did it wrong. Just let me demonstrate again. Try again. Do it. Treat the person um, as somebody who is really not trying to be mistake, to do mistakes. And to track small improvements. This is another characteristic of operant technique. Uh, sorry, I went backwards by mistakes. Um, <clears throat> is to track small improvements. It's one of the best motivating techniques. And to give enough practice for fluency. You can do it fast and easily, all with reinforcement, not punishment. So the part that I'm going to concentrate on is if the intern wasn't improving, the fault wasn't in the intern. It was in the contingencies. Contingencies are very complex. It's not just what you, what you say or the, the, all the post scenes. It's everything interrelated. But essentially, you're looking at the consequences of individual actions. If your cadets aren't improving, the fault isn't in the cadet. It's in the contingencies. Everyone behaves according to past and present contingencies in, over their behavior, including me. My behavior right now is being shaped by your response. If I see too many people going to sleep, I change my tone or do something different. Certainly the next time. Um, OK, these, there are practical implications. If you think of the, the um, fault in the cadet, it doesn't mean that the cadet's not responsible. You are responsible. You are the, the person that's doing something. And so you have to consider that if it's something, in a learning situation, it's easy just to say, try again. But if it's another kind of behavior, a dangerous behavior or something like that, you're responsible for administering the consequences. And they probably are punitive if it's something that you didn't want to see. But you have to do that. Otherwise, the whole system falls apart. So there's a difference between responsibility versus blame. But there are ethical implications, too. Because if you look at the cause, 
as being in the will, the free will, the, the decision of the cadet, you end up essentially blaming the person. The latest version of this is to blame the person's neurology, but it's still inside the person, and the typical uh, treatment of that is punishment. Plus, don't forget, if you say the cause is in, inside the person, you're looking at an antecedent. You're not looking at the effects. Cause and consequences, of course, you examine the interactions and see if you can change them. And if you can change them, you then see whether it was effective or not. And if it was, of course, you have improved things. You, ethical implications are all in where you attribute cause and what the consequences are for any particular treatment. What I hope you get from this is at least to think of looking at, at the consequences, to realize there is a science that can tell you what the effects of various different behaviors are. It doesn't tell you what to do any more than knowing, uh, learning about nuclear fission or any other science. The science doesn't say how it's going to be used. But if you know the effects of various treatments, you can use them to improve your behavior as a leader because it's governed by behavioral laws. You can gain success and respect using those behavioral laws. And that makes effective and ethical outcomes for everyone involved. Thank you. So now we have questions. People are always reluctant to, to ask questions. So uh, in, in, a, in some situations, I used to give a lot of uh, talks to teachers. And I wrote a book called Behavioral Objectives. And everybody had to write behavioral objectives on top of everything else they were doing. And they were mad as the devil when I walked in. And so I asked them to write on a little index card, what are the main complaints they have? about behavioral objectives. And then, using a few behavioral principles, I said, OK, now I group them. There were about 200 people in these groups. Group them into little uh, pods and said, OK, now you write the answer to those objectives. And then I had them come up and present. And they were funny. They, were, they knew their situation. They, you know, If I said, well, you should do x, they could say, oh, you don't know my school system. But it's their school source some person that's saying it. It was very effective. So I should hand it, hand it out index cards to you guys. But you've got to have questions. Yes. Uh, Graham Tennis. So I think it's, uh, it's an interesting situation when you have a single well-defined task and one trainer kind of the source of input. Um, but what about when you have a number of trainers uh, like 3,000, um, 3, <laughs> um, they're all trying to encourage goals that are not as well defined. Um, how do you apply operant conditioning in those, you know, the punishment or uh, the contingency based, I guess, uh, interactions um, in such a complex environment? That's an excellent question. Um, it's not one I can answer simply. But all I can say is that a lot of what you're doing here, where you group the whole freshman class into squadrons, and then they're broken down, and they're broken down, it's easier to work with a smaller group, as, as you implied. Um, so part of it is to, to get that sequence divided up into small enough sections so that they are handleable. But still, the one thing you can, can remember, if, if you look in any business and industry, you have one supervisor and a whole lot of employees. And typically, what's paid attention to are the errors. And they are usually punished. And it's amazing what difference it can make if you just remind yourself to notice 
what somebody did today that was better than yesterday. And if you have a lot of records, which you do in the military, and you can add more, you know, the, the, how many seconds did it take you to run around on your, on your beautiful marble <laughs> <laughs> uh, without slipping? Um, you, if, you, if you track your, your, the number of seconds, and another thing that's interesting is if you, I started jogging a while, while ago, and if you take your pulse, one of the things that goes down first when you improve your physique is your pulse. It'll go way down. And so you can see progress, and that motivates doing it more than two days before your test. <laughs> and we all procrastinate. So, um, but that's an excellent question. I don't know if I answered it, but the, I, I think the same things occur in society at large. Uh, punishment tends to produce resistance, antagonism, counter-punishment. Even, I would even say, you know, in the world at large. I think that uh, uh, people don't acknowledge enough what people do that is good. And because I, I was a teacher in fourth, third and fourth grade, and, and fortunately I had some training because I noticed that I did pay attention to the misbehaviors. And if you look in schools today, the kids that get the most attention are the ones that are misbehaving. Now, teacher atten attention, is that reinforcing? It may be. It may be that getting attention for throwing a spitball or using, taking your iPhone out and using it is, is worse than no attention. At least you're, it's attention. And you may get some approval from peers who like to see somebody uh, doing something against the teacher. So um, I, I think it works generally. There were some other hands. I don't want to cut you off. Yes? I'll get you. On, on uh, the statement you made that there's no such thing as free will. And the reason I'm asking is that a lot of what happens here is, is helping people learn to make their decisions with the facts and circumstances that they encounter. So uh, at least there's, there's an illusion that we all make choices. And I'm just curious how you would expand on, on that lack of free will statement. I think that if you acknowledge scientific laws that there's no room for something else besides your genetics, the respondent conditioning you've had, and the operant interactions you've had ever since birth. I mean, even the language you speak is shaped really early on. And I just don't think that there's anything there. Uh, people think that you have uh, a mind that makes decisions. Okay, well, what determines what decisions the mind makes? Well, is there another mind that makes the decisions for the first mind? And as I think it was Bernard Shaw, it's turtles all the way down. It's, it's, it's circular. How do you know he didn't decide to go? He didn't go. Well. Isn't his not going the evidence for he didn't decide to go? Yes, it is. It's totally circular. You don't get anywhere. Thank you. Good question. I had one over here. Which, which of you were first? I don't know. We'll get you both. <laughs> uh, Mary Hood, I was just going to ask, you talked about, so I don't know if you know, but like in, a lot of times in freshman year, like in the basic training environment, it's really designed to be extremely stressful and a lot of times like it's designed to have more negative consequences than positive consequences like to induce stress um, as a part of the design of the basic training process do you think that that can ever be positive or, or like ever useful or do you think that it should always like that, that should be adjusted so it's focused more on positive consequences as opposed to negative that's a, that's a good question I, I think that you have to learn to handle stress and how can you learn to handle it if it isn't there. But I think you have to be careful about what degree of stress there is. And some of the hazing kinds of things that go on 
can be so stressful that it's not helpful. But I think that um, uh, learning how to handle a situation is critical. Uh, they say in, in football or uh, in, in horse racing even, a horse can break a leg, actually break a leg, and continue the race under extreme pain. Football players can have injuries and continue to play, and sometimes they don't even know they've been hurt because they're so concentrated on their task at hand. And that's the kind of things you will be facing if you're ever in a combat situation. You're going to be getting very stressful situations which will produce all kinds of emotions, but you can overcome those emotions with your training of what the steps are, what plan ahead, what you're going to do if this happens, what you do if, if that happens, and you think of it in terms of of very operant behavior, it, it overrides a lot of the respondent emotions to the point where they are no longer controlling your behavior. That's what we call self-control. Thank you. Thank you. Now you had one. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always a matter of finding out the specific behaviors you want. If it's, if it's paying attention during a presentation, if it's running laps, uh, getting in, in physical shape, that's punishing. I mean, you can, doing push-ups is punishing if you're doing it to your, the limit of your ability. Um, <coughs> So you need some kind of reinforcement for that. And some of the reinforcement is avoiding punishment. It's not the best kind, but sometimes you start with that. But I would say that you want to, you have a lot of intermediate, intermittent reinforcement things. At some point, you don't have to walk on the marble anymore, right? Well, that's a reinforcer. Yeah, it's not huge, but it is, it is reinforcement, and you look forward to getting there, right? Or is it huge? Am I wrong? It's huge. <laughs> That's huge. <laughs> and you have a lot of, of different things going up. So the attempt is to make it all positive, but you can't always make everything positive. You can't make showing up to work on time positive. I remember trying to get kids coming to school on time by starting every day by reading a, uh, a story like Harry Potter and getting them in for re from recess for the same thing, reading a little bit, something that they were interested in. Yeah, it, worked, it worked better than, than the punishment technique, but it's, uh, it's tricky. It's tricky. You just, it, it's not really simple any more than force equals mass times acceleration, on the face of it, is very simple. Only three terms, right? But when you're in an airplane and you have currents and temperature changes and tailwinds and stuff like that, it's not so simple. 